Hello, hello, everybody. It is 1.13 p.m. Central Time on the 20th of December, 2020. It's Sunday here in the United States. Hope you're doing well. We are here to talk about seismic events, and it's been several days since actually recording an update. So I'm actually recording this, and I looks like I'm going to upload this to YouTube of all places. So let's get going. If you're new here, we're using Earthquake 3D, the program, and we have a combined feed of the USGS and the EMSC coming out of Europe. We're looking at about 48 hours where the older earthquakes are marked in pink and the lighter earthquakes are younger, they're marked in white. And then the earthquakes that are raised high off the globe, just for new people, these are deep earthquakes or deeper. They're down below the plates or at the bottoms of the plates. And we watch the deep earthquakes because there's a shallower, larger earthquake effect that usually happens next to the deep earthquakes and spreading up, out, and away from the deep earthquakes. So, for instance, we have a cluster of deep events right here. And you'll notice I've got a letter D on the map. It's been on here for years. It's a spot where we watch for new deep earthquakes to occur. All the way over here in the West Pacific at the pinnacle tip where the Pacific Plate makes a bend going over into the Solomon Islands here in Papua New Guinea. So it makes a U-shaped bend and goes down past New Caledonia and back up to Fiji. And, well, a bunch of deep earthquakes have struck here next to Fiji and Tonga. Additionally, to top it all off, a major cyclone blew through this area over the past several days. So while the area is being buffeted with a huge tropical system, we also have a series of deep earthquakes down below the location. Spreading out and away from the location, we have a 5 going down across the Kermadec Islands and going all the way down into New Zealand, where we have a 4.5 at Kaikoura, which fulfills the warning for the central part of New Zealand after the south and north part of New Zealand moved last week. So all of New Zealand has now shifted on about a mid-range 4 level in the last week. North Island, South Island, South Tip, all the way down to the X, and of course the 4.5 you see on the feed here now. We have an open area across about a thousand miles, maybe even more. I mean, that might even be the distance the United States is across, maybe just a little less. Huge area, open, no earthquakes in the last 48 hours. Now, on the other side of the open area, we have a bunch of earthquakes again. So we have a big open area where on one side we have energy, deep earthquakes, and a 5.1. We go over here and you'll see a series of other deep earthquakes that happened several days ago. And we have another letter D right there where the deep earthquakes happen, of course where we watch for that, and we have a 5.2. So deep earthquakes and a 5.2 on one side, deep earthquakes and a 5.1 on the other. It's about the same size, where the middle point, if we go around the bends of the plate, comes in somewhere right about here, Vanuatu, eastern Solomon Islands, or north of New Caledonia. I would watch that middle point still for something larger than what's on both sides to strike in the next several days. We call that middle point the fulcrum point like a two-arm scale where we have a balancing weight on both sides and the combined total of the weight adds up in the middle. Aziz, check it out, guys. 2.6 coming in on the edge of the craton, or one of the edges of the cratons that, plural, make up the plate across Australia. But new 2.6 comes rolling in, and just a few days back, I don't know if it's even on here anymore. No, the USGS didn't cover it. But small earthquake came in up here, a three-point-something earthquake again up on the northwest edge. I think a new earthquake also struck down next to Perth, or at least in the southwest portion of Australia, but I don't know where. It was a few days ago, and I just saw it rolling by. I wasn't doing updates, taking a few days off. A lot of stuff going on in the world, you know? The last thing we need is more earthquakes, right? Now look at the equal spread of fours going across over into Indonesia, and the equal spread of fours going all the way up to Japan. We'll get into Japan in a second, because that's the largest earthquake of the past few days, a mid-range six to low-end six. Low end to mid-range 6, we'll call it that, came in on the northeast shores of Japan last night, or this morning, international time. But you can see the spread of 4s, and the highest we're going is 4.9. Now, why does that matter? Look over here to the east. Another 4.9. Well, wait, that's two 4.9s. And wait, there's another one up here, uh, right in the middle of the whole hot mess. Uh, another 4.9. And, well, wow, look, another 4.8, which originally was a 4.9. That's a lot of 4.9s, wouldn't you say? It's like four 4.9s equally spaced. Ah, look at this one. A new one, just a new 4.8. <laughs> a new 4.8 just struck right in the spot where I'm talking here. What, in 1907 UTC. 
10 minutes ago, a new 4.8 to 4.9 struck there. So it's a lot of the same sized activity. And again, 4.8, 4.8, 4.9, 4.9, 4.9, 4.9, 4.9. All the way around, and let me show you what we're going around. This, this spot here, the red lines. So 4.8, 4.8, 4.9, 4.9, another 4.9, and another 4.9. All around the edge of the plate boundary going up to Japan, where the biggest of the bunch came rolling in last night or this morning. Again, international time, just a few hours ago. And it's 6.2 to 6.3. Let's get all the other smaller earthquakes out of there. So you could say the 6.2, 6.3 is really sandwiched in the middle or on the north middle point of the plate boundary where all the energy down here pulled up and we're striking up here along the most famous earthquake zone on the planet. And again, that's the coast of Honshu, Japan, or northeast of the coast of Honshu, Japan, south of Hokkaido, again, where the big ring is or circle is here from the USGS. So that's a pretty noteworthy sized earthquake. I, I think it is the first six to strike in Japan in a little bit. They've been flirting around with the upper five level for the last several months. Additionally, to top it all off, the equal spacing of these earthquakes around the whole plate boundary indicates the push came from down here. Let's go back to the map one more time. The push came from down here where all the deep earthquakes are hammering up on the underside of the plate, spread up on the west side, spread up on the east side, re-pooled back together here where the plate boundary comes together like a letter H shape on the north side. Think of this like a river, two rivers, that come back together and the stream or the flow recombines into something greater where they reconnect. Over to the west, we go over into Japan or out of Japan, or did I say the west? The northwest. We go out of Japan and we go over into Siberia, Russia, Mongolia, China, nothing going on across two continents. That's odd because we're really going right up to their borders at this point and we go all the way over to Europe and but there's nothing reported across these areas and I'm here to tell you most likely if we had them incorporated into the USGS feed or the European feed we would see small earthquakes reported if they reported them. I mean if the Russians or the Chinese somehow were reporting small earthquakes across their countries to the general public which I don't think they do but if they do it's very limited we would see a line of earthquakes going across Siberia and going across China, re-pooling back up over here at the Takalamakan Desert. What like happened last week, for instance. You don't see the earthquakes on here now. Let's see if they're still on there. Hold on. Yeah, you don't see them on there. But last week, right here, they did report two 4.7s. We zoomed in on the 4.7s, and one was directly below a coal-fired power plant, like five kilometers down below the power plant, and the other location was an oil gas storage drill point location in the Taklamakan Desert. Both 4.7s, both at man-made locations. Drill points, basically. They may even be doing geothermal at that coal plant, guys. Now, 4.3, striking at the tip of the arrow, that's right in the middle of Afghanistan. And then going to the west, we are again quiet across Iran. We get right up to the border of Iran, and we got another 4.3. Now, just wait a second. We got a 4.3 on one side and a 4.3 on the other. Two of the same sized quakes. Now what would you do if I told you those two points are actually connected? Let's go show you. So, 4.3 here, 4.3 here. Now how are they connected? Well we go down across the plate boundary to the south to the number seven shaped Carlsberg Ridge that actually goes out into the ocean. But you see it comes back up and goes to the north, but both of these are on the north side of the red line. And USGS doesn't have anything connecting between the two at all, does it? No red line there. The red line goes down through South Iran. Well, I've shown this a thousand times, but I'll show it a thousand and one now. We're going to go over to the Mideast, and we're going to look across Iran. And I should just turn off the borders and labels and places just so you can see a little bit better. This is Iran, and on the north side, you'll see the mountains. And on the south side, of course, you see the mountains too. USGS plate boundary goes down to the south, down to the number seven Carlsberg Ridge. But on the north side, you'll see the mountains do the same thing. They make a bend like a flowing river across north Iran, going up into Georgia and Russia. This is the Caspian Sea here. We have uh, Tehran, the big city right in there on the south of the Caspian Sea. Anyway, the mountains go around both sides of Iran. So we're getting back over to the USGS plate boundary map. I think they should have like a dotted line or something indicating that there's actually maybe an old plate boundary or maybe it's a uncharted unknown plate boundary there's a connection point between these two spots and that's the mountain ranges that are folded and bent the same way that the southern mountain ranges are and in the middle 
it's flowing around this block of the craton or block of the plate that makes up the pretty much whole Middle East. And the mountains really do look like they're flowing like a river over a long time. And maybe they are. Wouldn't that be wild? Now, once we get over to Europe, you'll see this backwards S-shaped bend in Eastern Europe covered in trees. These are all mountains as well. And the triangles indicate where there are volcanic locations marked by the Smithsonian. Now, at every bend in the plate, we have a volcanic location. Sheb Basin, East Eiffel, going back over to the Bruntal, back down around to the South Hargitas, and go back down into Greece and Turkey, down here to the south, where we all know about the volcanoes at Greece and Turkey. Now, looking at the plate boundary, you'll see, going through Greece and Turkey, of course, we have the W-shaped plate boundary marked by the USGS. But on the eastern side of Europe, going through Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, nothing, right? It's just white on the USGS map. But we go here and you'll see the mountains certainly make a certain shape and that the volcanic fields marked by the Smithsonian map out the bends in that shape. This is the interior craton edge of Europe. We have a craton edge in the United States. Kind of looks almost the same, but it's turned on its side. I'll get to that in a moment, but we have to talk about Poland. Poland got hit. Now, it's a magnitude and a half under what I warned for. I was looking for up to five. But instead, sorry, drinking my coffee. But instead, we get a 3.5 to maybe upper three at the most. Same time, around the same time, today in the last 24 hours, a 3.3 to 3.5 struck over in eastern Romania. Now, wait a second, that's two of the same sized earthquakes. And like I said, going up through Poland, let's go back to Google Earth here, over into Romania, up into Poland. That's the Craton Edge. And it's threes going across the Craton Edge instead of upper fours to fives. Which means there's still energy trapped down here in South Europe that has not escaped out. And we're pushing with the same sized earthquakes across Eastern Europe. Again, Romania on the S-shaped bend over to the east. Maybe I should turn down the rings a little. There we are. And Poland. And we warned Poland. Very specific about Poland and where to watch. Southwest Poland right there. So we're a magnitude and a half off. Now check it out. Going down across over to Western Europe on the Pyrenees. Right here, the mountain range that goes between Spain and France. Another same-sized earthquake, 3.4. So 3.3 and 3.5 on one side of Europe. 3.4 on the other side of Europe. Both on the edges of the plate boundary, or the craton edges. And then, to top it all off, right in the middle, in the last two days, 4.1 earthquake came rolling in down here at the south boot tip of Italy, right next to Mount Etna. Mount Etna's down here on Sicily. And Mount Etna's been putting off big blasts over the past week and a half or so. Then, to seal the deal that the middle of the Craton's moving, a same-sized earthquake, exactly the same size, 4.1. They both struck the same day, a day and a half ago. Two days ago. Now, this one was a day ago. So, day, day and a half ago. And this is at Albania-Greece border. We had warned Albania, Montenegro, Greece. We had warned Italy up to the north, which we talked about last week. But now, same-sized earthquakes right in the middle. Two 4.1s in the middle. Mid-range threes going around both sides of Europe. You'll notice also that another earthquake struck next to the six from this past week. Up here east, northeast of Jan Mayen Island. The tiny little island here. Jan Mayen. J-A-N. Jan. Okay. Jan Mayen Island. And we have Svalbard up here to the north where the International Seed Bank is. And on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that pretty much cuts the whole plate in half, goes all the way up here to the very North Pole where there's a super volcano right down below the North Pole. Right here, 60 miles long, 30 mile wide crater, right below the very north tip about a 1,000 miles away from the Gakko Ridge. Summing it all up, going back over here, the largest earthquake of the day, Japan, 6.3. Equal spaced fours, well, 4.9s, come on. Let's just call them all fives. That's really what they are. A bunch of fives down to the south, re-pulling back up to a six up to the north. That's really what just happened. A bunch of deep earthquakes here. Also that tropical system, which can have an earthquake effect, an electromagnetic earthquake effect with the big storms, but not getting into that right now and a spread going down to New Zealand. Over to Europe, like I said, equal spread of fours on the south side, going to the middle with the biggest of the bunch, and then going around the outside edge of Europe all the way. 
The only thing I didn't mention is the other three something. What is that? A 3.1? Striking down at the Canary Islands. These are the Azores out here where the X is. These are the Canary Islands down here to the south. And we're right there in the middle of the Canaries with the mid-range three. Speaking of mid-range threes, South Africa. Now, I would just like to pull the info on this because I just have to see if it's a shallow earthquake or what. Botswana. Botswana, Africa. Let's go pull the coordinates and just go see what's there. There might not be anything there. It's right at the border between South Africa and Botswana. And it's not every day I got to look up earthquakes in Africa. So people were asking me, by the way, why don't they report earthquakes out of Africa? And that's just the question of the century. They do, but not all the time. It's like, I don't know what's going on there. A whole continent without earthquake activity? Come on. We know there's something going on there. Okay, what do we have around the area? Uh, let's turn on our places, our borders and labels, just to, again, okay, there is the border between the two countries, Botswana and South Africa. Oh, man, look at the Craton Edge. Whoa, volcano. Hey, we've got ourselves old volcanism here. Lava flows. Yeah, let's just make sure about that. Hold on. Oh, yeah, okay. Old volcanism. I'm talking, these are so old, you wouldn't even really call these volcanoes they don't even have a place mark on them but that's what this is we're on the edge of a craton too which i like i said about the european craton the folds and bends in the edge of the plate get a load of this get a load of the ancient volcanism that makes this up what, what do we got going on here well is that, that's a lack of lip that's a it's got to be that has to be a lacolith, a bulge in the plate caused by intruding magma from an ancient time long ago. It's not, it, look, it's it's rising. It's a rising dome. It's not an impact crater or anything. People might say, oh, look, it looks like an impact crater. Yeah, no, no, that's not an impact crater. That's a bulge, a circular bulge in the plate. We see these in other places. I could show you some of these in Iran, for instance. Almost look exact same. On the edge of the plate boundary, though, or on the edge of the craton boundary, and... Africa is made up of, <laughs> I don't even know how many, but Africa is made up of several plates or several cratons, and that's where we are. That is so interesting. I'm going to have to remember that, the big volcano that's not marked down in Africa at the Botswana border. Okay, now let's jump over across the Pacific and go over to South America. Same-sized earthquakes. And I mean the exact same size. What were we dealing with over here? 5.1, 5.2, right? There's the 5.2, there's the 5.1, some deep earthquakes, and some mid-range 4s going up to 4.9. And look at what we have here. A 5.2 coming across, a bunch of earthquakes in the 4 to upper 4 range going as high as 4.9 and 5.0. And its X marks the spot, the South Sandwich Islands, which we talked about watching for a flow to go down to a couple days ago. Well, actually, <laughs> five or six days ago. I've been doing little short updates online on Twitch, but I haven't been saving them, so I guess you had to catch me live to talk about this, but we were talking about the volcano, Villa Rica, that had come back alive down here in South Chile, and that we watch all the way down here at the southeast tip of the plate boundary. And Villa Rica is right back up here, so if we get an eruption in the middle right here, in between where our earthquakes are, then we watch. That's a sign that there's force flowing down underneath the plate. So it's the exact same size movement on both sides of the plate. And let me show you both sides of the plate on the USGS map here. Again, going down across New Zealand and over to the west, and jumping across and going down across this fracture zone, down to the south and over to the east. Both sides of the plate spreading out equally, which would mean that we're due for 6.0 range activity down in South America, just because on the other side of the plate, equally across into the northwest, Japan is moving, and we've seen a back and forth. By the way, we've seen a back and forth between Japan. You remember the day Kyushu got hit with the big earthquake? South Japan? Several years ago. Big crack went right across the whole island. The same day, within 24 hours, same-sized earthquake within a few points of each other. I mean, like, it was a 7 in Kyushu, and it was a 6.8 or whatever right down here in Ecuador. Then the next day, it happened again. There was a big earthquake over here next to Solomon Islands, and then there was a big earthquake over here off the coast of Mexico. It went back and forth like a tennis match several years ago. 
Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen now, but I would think that there would be something, se- not seven point zeros now, a couple of years ago. I would think now we're talking about something at least a magnitude less because Japan's in the six range. But the middle point here was the spot that we would watch. So North Peru, South Ecuador, right in between our four sets of arrows. We have two arrows pointing to the south, two arrows pointing to the north. The Andes Mountains, the flow goes around over to the north. Central America, last day and a half, Europeans reporting earthquakes, USGS. I don't know what to tell you guys. If you're using the USGS site, you're just going to look at this and you're going to see a big blank across all of Mexico. And that's not accurate. Let's get a sip of my coffee while you think about that. So if you have to combine feeds from other countries to get the info right on our shores, 4.0 striking in the Gulf of California, Three is going down across South Central America. Now, at this point, we should go check the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center and see if there's any new volcanoes in Central America, South America, even in the West Pacific. So West P- Pacific, for instance, South Japan. Suwanizajima just blew up with a just small blast, 4,000, but an explosive blast. Kluchevskoy up at Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. Fuego in Guatemala, Popocatepetl in Mexico, San Jay in Ecuador. Sabankaya, Kluchevskoy, Fuego, Kluchevskoy. It's just a repeat of all the regular suspects that we normally see on the list. I look for oddballs. I look for new volcanoes to show up if there's any kind of increase going on. We'll see new volcanoes that we haven't seen on the list before or in years suddenly pop off with a new blast. That's not happening right now. Instead, it's all of our usual suspects that are just putting off moderate-sized blasts. Now, that could change at a moment's notice. I don't forecast eruptions at all. I just look to see where the... Oh, hold on one second. I just look to see where... Sorry about that. Uh, Where the eruptions are happening, and then that lets me know where there's a big increase in seismic getting ready to take place. So if there's a bunch of blasts happening somewhere, no duh, we watch for seismic compensation after that. Because the magma chambers shift and move with a, a large expulsion of contents from the chambers that then causes a plate shift if you have enough of those and we've seen that happen before okay venezuela got hit with a 4.7 going across the little arrow there right there on the northeast tip i guess is that that's still the andes mountains going over to the north side of south america but we're now a day beyond my seven day warning for the east caribbean I warned right over here in the East Caribbean, going from Venezuela up to the northeast tip of the plate boundary coming out of the Caribbean, for a 5.5. And instead, guess what hit? Nada. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. And that's odd. That is extremely odd. We would normally expect the flow to go across and go out to the letter X's, which USGS doesn't have anything out here in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We have our two X's. And they've been strangely quiet for, what, two weeks now? Maybe even longer? Meanwhile, the flow, we have a bunch of eruptions going on across Central America. Popocatépetl, Fuego, Telica, Telica, Nevados de Chilean, or no, I'm sorry, Nevado del Ruiz Volcano, Reventador and San Jay, all across here erupting. Earthquakes going across here, and they get over to about here, and nothing over to the east. That means we are building up in power over on the east edge of the Caribbean. And we have tension between our two X's out in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and where the energy is coming across. Right now you can see it. So between the two is where we watch. And that puts us right here. Between the X and the energy coming across. But everybody back behind it, so Puerto Rico for instance, I would expect the number of earthquakes in Puerto Rico to go up. And I hope I got this right. Because if I'm wrong, it's going to go right into Puerto Rico. I think it's going to go out to the X's. It's been long enough. The tension's building. It should break in the East Caribbean and then go out to the X's. I hope I'm right. If I'm wrong, it's going to go to the swarm spot in Puerto Rico. And that'll be a not good. So let's just... Or, or hope I'm totally wrong on all this. And that the energy's going into maybe a volcano there that we don't know about that's going to send some activity off. And it won't hurt anybody. And instead, it'll just send off a... New blast from a volcano we haven't seen in months or years over in the Eastern Caribbean, which does happen from time to time. Okay, United States. Here we are. It takes the whole update to get to us. The reason it does for new people, 
I'm not trying to drag this out and make you watch the whole planet. You have to understand that we in the United States usually get the flow last. The energy starts where our deep earthquakes are. Goes out over to Europe, like I told you, up to Japan, like I told you, and over to South America, like I told you, straight out and away from where it hammers in on the underside of the plate. Now, once you get beyond Japan, we have to go up, around, over through Alaska, and that follows the plate boundary to the north. Let me show it to you on the USGS map here. Starting here, where the deep earthquakes hammer up, we spread out and across, straight across. Path of least resistance, reaching out to the north and to the south. Hence my two giant arrows going across the Pacific here. But once we get up to Alaska on the north side, we go around past Japan and look what it does. The plate boundary makes a bend and goes down into the west coast of the United States, down into the Juan de Fuca fracture zone that has these sawtooth-shaped jagged edges, which really, those jagged edges belong to the Pacific plate. So this energy is coming up, goes into the plate. Once it gets up into Alaska, it hits the North American craton, which I have a good diagram of here. I've been showing it for the last 10 years. And on the edge of the craton, we have a few features. We have the accretionary belt that goes all the way up into Alaska. We have the deformed craton that's marked in purple, and that's at the California-Nevada border. And then we have the interior craton edge, the more stable portion, as they call it. And that is from Colorado, basically, all the way down to the south in the United States and all the way up the east coast. So the energy comes in from the northwest. One more time, craton edge, northwest. Let's compare to the earthquakes in the last two days. There we go. So a line of threes and a line of threes. And in between the two line of threes, right in the middle, in the middle of this big open area where there's no other earthquakes, 5.0 in the middle. The biggest earthquake in the middle on both sides, just again like a two-arm scale where we have weight on both sides that accumulates in the middle. This is more like a wave that accumulates in the middle. And we get the bigger earthquake in the middle. Now, it's not that the bigger earthquake in the middle caused the earthquakes on either side. And it's not that the earthquakes on either side technically caused the earthquake in the middle. That's not what's going on here. The earthquake in the middle and the earthquakes on both sides are all caused by a greater inundating power or force or tension. I think very low frequency or ultra low frequency. So like this is a wave pooling up in the middle. And I can show this to you in an example of a standing wave in a laboratory. Let me show this to you here. So a standing wave forming in a tank, of course, a tank of water. And this is low frequency. And both of these tank sides, or one of the tank sides, I don't know if it's both of them or one of them, are pushing in and pulling out from each other. So this end is slightly moving in and out. And that end is slightly moving in and out. Or one of them is. And it's pumping more energy into the tank. And instead of becoming jostling, chaotic waves, these combine and form into organized standing waves that get more power or more amplitude in them, the higher and more powerful the wave becomes as you pump more energy into it. Now notice the spacing on these and how the biggest of the bunch is in the middle, of course, as you know, with a wave. And we get back to the earthquakes and the same thing. Think of this like hammering action on both sides and the standing wave forms in the middle across thousands of miles. And the earthquakes drop off along the peaks of the waves, or, or the trough or valley of the wave, as it goes across. Amazing, right? Okay, United States, lower 48. We'll get into Hawaii last. Aloha, guys. Hey, you know, Hawaiians, just just hang, hang tight there really quick. Or what, what do you, how do you say that? Brah, brah, chill. All right, U.S., I think we should talk about the largest earthquake in the last day and a half across the whole United States, which is directly in one of our warned areas. Colorado and Oklahoma were both warned, and instead, Colorado and the Kansas-Oklahoma border got hit. So what's at the Colorado border? Well, first of all, the Craton Edge goes right down through Colorado. Now, wait, they have this listed out of Utah, don't they? Aren't they tricky? Ah, the good old USGS, a surface earthquake, but not a blast, or is it? Let's go see what's at the Colorado-Utah border, where they triangulated this sucker from Utah, but it's in Colorado. And how do I know it's in Colorado? Here's the coordinates from the USGS. Here's the state line. 
The star is where the earthquake is. I, again, guys, I don't know what the deal is with them, but let's back this out and just show you on Google Earth. There is Colorado. And I used to live out here, guys. Not here, but in Colorado. Here's the earthquake epicenter. And look where the earthquake epicenter is coming in next to a drill point. Now, these look like saline ponds, but I'm not quite sure. I am sure there are tanks here and pipeline and some kind of pumping apparatus. And it could be well water. They could be getting water from this, some water purification. Maybe they have a drill point there. Maybe not. I labeled it as fracking since I don't know exactly what it is. And it's got tanks and some kind of saline ponds there. It also has power lines running to it. Now, Paradox, California, or California, Paradox, Colorado is the nearest larger town. So I don't know why they wouldn't triangulate it from Paradox. And again, that's an iffy on the fracking location there. But certainly there are drill points there of some kind. And drill points are the main fault, no pun intended. So the fault of the earthquake. I need to show you something else that happened. South Central Colorado. Now, it wasn't just Western Colorado. These are two sets of earthquakes in Colorado on the same 24-hour time period. This is somewhat rare. We go weeks without earthquakes reported in Colorado at all. So to get three in a day, let's go put the coordinates in down at South Central Colorado, which I just showed you again on the Craton diagram here. Look at Colorado. It goes right through the Continental Divide. The Craton Edge. Right down through here, where I'm getting ready to show you. Now, this is where the largest earthquake in the last 150 years of state history took place. Trinidad, Colorado had a 5.9 earthquake that they downgraded to 5.4 back in 2011. Let's again show you where we are. Here's southern Colorado. There's the border with New Mexico. And on the western side here, right over here, we get out into this. Now, I don't know if you'll see it, but let me zoom in and show you. A closer zoom in on it. Ah, there we go. See these ponds lined with black liner? And do you see the pump in the tank? Well, these are pumping operations. Now, I think they're doing mainly gas here. Now, these are gas, oil, gas pumping operations. And it, they're well known. Now, again, they, these are very well known out here. And there's some more of the pipeline where they put all the gas and oil together and put it out, I guess, several miles to a refinery of some kind. And you see how many pads there are. These are not campsites. Every one of these is a different oil or gas drill point. Some of them actually still have the jack or pump, which you can see in the proper angle of sunlight, like a sundial. But every one of these going all the way across the whole area is a different drill point. Now, once we get down into New Mexico, they don't have state regulations that put protective covers over the jacks or pumps. So you can actually see the shadow of the actual jack, which proves it's oil. Like this right here, for instance. In Colorado, they build a shed around it, right? That's what we were just looking at, the sheds and the ponds in Colorado. And on the New Mexico side of the border, you get the straight-up oil well without a shed over it. State regulations, right? Okay, so we're on the edge of the Craton. We're at other drill points in South Colorado, and we're right next to drill points over in Western Colorado. Whether they're for oil or gas or water or geothermal, they're at drill points. Now, once we go over to the east, over into Kansas, same thing. Drill points. Same with down in Oklahoma. Drill points. And that's not even really too controversial. Like, I should just be able to tell you that. You could be like, okay, yeah, I heard about Oklahoma and Kansas and the drill points. But if you haven't, let me just pull a coordinate and go find the nearest drill point for you so you can see how close we get. Sometimes we're right next to a well. Other times we're just a couple miles away. And they can drill out by a few miles, several miles in many instances. Or we have old drill points. Where are we here? Meccano Air Force Base again. See, this gets me in. <laughs> oh, all right, this gets me into where I don't want to go look things up because we get next to an Air Force Base or next to bunker facilities. <laughs> gets a little troubling. What do we have going on right in here? Do we have anything of any significance nearby the highway that I can just look up easily without getting myself into too much trouble? And yes, I will get shut down if I go and find something I'm not supposed to. We've zoomed in on missile silos. We've zoomed in on training locations. <laughs> I've even caught directed energy weapons going, or, or satellite beam downs going down into military bases. 
So, yeah, we try to stay off the controversial side. I don't see any marked drill points around this, but I am right next to the Air Force Base, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> VLF, guys. VLF, but let me prove the drill points to you, because, again, if you're a new viewer, you're not going to know what I'm talking about with the drill points. Let's go down into Oklahoma and get one from there. Quinton, Oklahoma. So, again, you'd have to understand how the military relates into this. It's not that they have an earthquake machine. But there's a byproduct of very low frequency communications between military facilities, a well-known byproduct, an earthquake effect that happens from the communications. That very low frequency. Okay, where are we? We are down here in beautiful Oklahoma. And like I said, there's going to be drill points all over the place down here. There's 500,000 different drill points across Oklahoma. Here's the oil well at the center of the jack. That's not for, this isn't for cattle or for farming. And they're all over the place down here, the drill points, that are that is. Uh, we can just go down, the, go down the roads and you'll find more. And they put protective berms around the tanks now, on purpose, state regulation. They used to not to. They used to just have a out-in-the-middle-of-the-woods kind of thing going on here. And you can see they do it with stones sometimes. So that's in case anything leaks out. Usually there's no leaks, though. Down to the south, there's more. And you start to get the picture for how many there are once we zoom around the area a little bit. You'll start seeing a lot of tanks, a lot of pipelines, a lot of pumps. And you can see where the clusters of gas are. It makes sense there's clusters of gas here. So look what they're doing. They're drilling out this whole crescent shape here. But let's turn off our borders and labels and check this out. Remember Africa at the start of this update where I zoomed in and the folds and bends in the plate? You remember over in Europe, where I told you, hey, uh, we're on the edge of the plate over here in Romania. Here we are in the United States, and here's our S-shaped bend. I told you, Europe has an S-shaped bend, and ours is just turned sideways through the south. But just like in Europe, it's making folds and bends. And on the folds and bends, there's a, apparently a lot of oil and gas. And hence our earthquake coming in right next to all of these drill points. 500,000 different drill points across Oklahoma going up into Kansas. Now, it could be that up in Kansas, it's not related to the Air Force Base, that there's an old drill point at the location. I don't really want to take <laughs> the time to go look that up. Let's go over into Illinois really quick, because we got an earthquake right across the river from where I'm at. If you don't know where I live, I'm from Missouri. Missouri, uh, sorry. Depending on where you are in the state, it's either Missouri or Missouri. I'm kind of in the middle point. I could say it either way. Okay, sorry about that. Just had a little cough there. So over in Illinois, is there anything over the, in Illinois that we need to know about? Well, let's first turn on our borders, labels, places, and back it out. Here's St. Louis. Again, for reference, my location right over here. And here's the earthquake. Now wait, wait till you see what's right here. Hold on, actually, let me search it. We're less than one county away from the giant Air Force Base here where they built dueling airports. <laughs> Quite literally, we are right next to it, guys. So I wonder, I, again, I'm just wondering, this is out loud wonder. If I'm coming in within a county of a large Air Force base on multiple earthquakes on the same day, that's odd, especially in Illinois where there's not much else over here. Now, a couple counties over to the east, there are drill points for oil and gas, and I already have a lot of those marked. I don't know if there's any more down here in South Illinois. I would have to go check and see. Oh, wait. There are. There's a, look at this. There's an oil well right below a set of high voltage power lines. I had no idea there were oil wells this close to St. Louis. Oh man, that is just, I'm marking it. I'm marking this one. Wow. Okay. Well, they added more. And we can go right up here and go to the tank. There's the tank and the pipeline's going to go through here too. Where there's one, there's more. Now these high voltage power lines. Here, here's another tank right there. That's not for farming, guys. That is not for farming. Where's the other oil well? Right here. There's another one. 
I, I don't know if that's oil or uh, gas, so I'll just put well. Could be either. Could be both. Okay, how many are there? Where, again, where there's one, there's more. There's a whole oil patch here just over east of St. Louis. My God, that's just begging for an earthquake on the New Madrid Seismic Zone. This is the New Madrid Seismic Zone north side going over to the Wabash Valley Seismic Zone. I don't think it's wise to drill this. Oh, my goodness. Well, you find out something new every day. So we have high voltage power lines here that come down right next to the drill points. And again, I'm thinking there's probably some more down here. If there's a few right, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Got a pipeline. Well, that's a pipeline. Hold on, let's find where the where the well is. Right here. I wonder if we have a street level on this where I can actually see the well at ground level. Let's go see. Inquiring minds want to know, and we haven't even got into the West Coast. This is my neighborhood, guys. This is my neck of the woods. Dang. Okay, they don't have a street level. No wonder it's out in the middle of nowhere, but let's just see if we can see something. We got a farm right there. Beautiful. Well, I'm not seeing very much. They should have like oil pipeline markers, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, hey, no, that's fiber optic. All right, I don't see any wells in this street level, so let's just get on out of here. But I got to look. Again, if I see an oil patch 50 miles from my house or something, <clears throat> a county and a half, two counties away. Again, if I'm, I'm right here and they've got an oil patch right here and the New Madrid seismic zone is, here's New Madrid, the town of New Madrid is down here, south of Cairo. There's New Madrid. And this is the N-shaped bend of the New Madrid Seismic Zone, and you're drilling the hell out of it on the north side, going over to the Wabash Valley Seismic Zone? My goodness gracious. Boy, we have an earthquake there. Over on the east edge of the Craytown, over in eastern Tennessee, no drill points there. But I got to look it up just to see if it's an explosion or a blast. No, it's a 23.5 kilometer depth down on the east edge of the North American Craton. So that sums up the Midwest quakes starting over in... Western Colorado next to a drill point, going down to Southern Colorado next to a drill point, going over to Oklahoma, all across Oklahoma drill points, and it's questionable up in Kansas, we're right next to an Air Force base. We go over here into Illinois and we're next to an Air Force base and we're next to a drill point again. Finally, we have one lone quake that's not next to anything except for the edge of the Craton. Now, West Coast, United States. First of all, we're looking at about 48 hours worth of earthquakes. I'd like to look at the last 24 hours. This is going to remove a few off the feed, but we really need to see what's moved in the last day. So here's the 0, 0.0 and greater feed for the last 24. Let's get another sip of my coffee, as if I need any more, right? Okay, 24 hours worth of quakes. Starting up in the northwest. Two. And I have to look them up because they might actually not all be earthquakes. Well, this is Tampico, Washington. Tampico. That's an odd name for Washington, isn't it? Isn't that type of like orange juice or something? Uh, okay, let's go, let's go up to the northwest and see what's here. We're north of the Octonum Ridge structures, which go west to east, but they're further down to the south, I think. Pretty sure. But these aren't close enough for that. Oh, wait. We're right next to a hydroelectric power generating station and large transmission lines, high voltage transmission lines going out from the hydroelectric power generation. Another set of power line earthquakes. I mean, that was right over in Illinois too. I mean, the power lines were there too. I forgot to mention that. So, wow. Okay. Now let's go up here and look at the 2.7 in Seattle. Ravensdale, Washington. And if we go really quick and just look on the USGS map, you're going to see the same earthquake. Here's the 2.7. Here's the Seattle Fault going over to the west into the Olympic Peninsula. Port coordinates, paste, and search, and we will see what's here. Oh, uh-oh. Another set of major high-voltage power lines. I guess this is going to be supplying the city of Seattle. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Dang, look at that. Have you guys ever seen it? <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, you got power there. Unlimited 
Power! Do it. Okay, that was the Dark Lord impersonation of the Sith. As we go down to the south, Oregon, no earthquakes. Over to the east, over into Idaho, a cluster still in central Idaho above the magma chamber for Yellowstone. But Yellowstone Park itself, not a single microquake even. Now there are tremors that happen in Yellowstone every day. Hundreds of them, sometimes even thousands. But those are tremors. We don't have any fracturing going on above the magma chamber much anymore. Last week, there were dozens, if not more, maybe even a couple hundred, small earthquakes as cracking or breaking was taking place in the faults up above the magma chamber for Yellowstone. But since then, a flow went across the plate. Colorado, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, all started to move on the edge of the craton. And then the swarm died out at Yellowstone. So tension was created up here on the edge of the craton. And then it was relieved. A new push is apparently still, well, not still taking place. A new push might be developing here very soon. On top of the previous push that was taking place, we'll call it that, the previous episodic tremor slip. Let's go look at the tremor map and see what's going on for yesterday, the 19th. Zero tremors. Ah, oh, the plate just stopped moving. <laughs> no. The plate never stops moving, ever. There should always be at least a handful of these small little tremors every day. Let's go back a day to the 18th. Zero who are they kidding? Okay, go back to the 17th, three days ago, 20. I I'm here to tell you, if the plate ever actually stopped shifting completely, like not with a single vibration across a three-state area, we would be dead the next day. Okay? So if it goes down to zero, that's an outage of some kind. That's some kind of technical outage. Or they're just not capable of picking up the tremors for some reason now. But I don't know about all that. I'm just here to tell you the plate never stops shifting. Ever. It moves every day. All right, so no earthquakes in Oregon. No tremors in Oregon. No tremors in Washington. Two earthquakes yesterday in Washington. No earthquakes today in Washington. No earthquakes. No tremors. No nothing. Totally quiet. Day off work. Yeah, nothing suspicious there. How about no earthquakes reported across Canada either? All of Canada, all the West Coast of the United States. Hmm. Once we get right down across the border of California, though, all of a sudden there's earthquakes again. It's a miracle. Now let's go up here and take a look. Shingletown, California. Mother Nature just picks back up in California all of a sudden. I would propose to you that there is a lack of reporting of earthquakes as opposed to the whole plate stopping and there being no seismic activity for a day. Now, well, I shouldn't say no seismic activity. They've got one earthquake reported up here from today. That, that'll be their excuse. They'll be like, oh, we reported an earthquake. What are you talking about, Dutch? There's one right there. I'll be like, yeah, one. Yeah, okay. Uh, hey, whatever. Let's go down to the south into Shingletown, see what's there. Here's the earthquake epicenter. We are at the edge of Silver Lake Volcanic Field in Northern California on the edge of Hall Butte to the, to the east. We're to the west of that. And we're to the south of Silver Lake. Now, Silver Lake, let's read it. Lava flows from two isolated cinder cones northwest of Lassen Peak blocked drainages forming three small lakes. The cones lie southwest of Bernie Mountain and west-northwest of McGee Peak. So there it is. It's old. It's from the Ice Age of the Pleistocene. We're right on the edge of it. Latour Butte, you may remember, if you're a viewer of mine from two years ago, when all the earthquakes broke out around Latour, and then within a short period of time, a bunch of fires broke out all the way down across California, right around these areas where the earthquakes were taking place. So that's where the 0 0.9 is. Over to the west, 1.7 coming in right on the edge of the plate again. Let's go up here, Northern California. Here's the plate boundary, San Andreas. It goes down across the coast, goes down to Southern California, obviously, and we're right on the edge of it, right where it comes in from the Juan de Fuca fracture zone where there's no seismic being reported. Okay. Once we get down here to this stack of earthquakes, 
It's a stack of earthquakes. It is a swarm, but the magnitudes on this are low. We're all in the zero range. A bunch of zeros striking here. Just little vibrations, really. You could call them tremors. Why is this tremoring? Why are there small vibrations happening here in a cluster? Let me show you. All of these little pads go to different drill points on the side of this volcanic field. Here's Clear Lake Volcanic Field, Mount Kanakti in the middle. And on the south side, all of these drill points to get steam. And the steam takes via pipeline up to the turbines. And the turbines turn and provide power for the area. Electrical power, major high voltage generation there. So what's up? What's up? We've got high voltage again. How many is that? That's like three now. And it's not like these high voltage power lines are everywhere because I just looked up a bunch of other locations and there are no high voltage power lines. Let's go over to the east, shall we? We're just going to look these up all the way down through California. Over here, east of Lake Tahoe. See where it says Carson City, Nevada. We're eight kilometers west northwest of it, of Carson City. I'd say we're really near South Reno. And we know what's in South Reno, or at least I do, and my viewers, you guys probably do too. Here, Steamboat Springs, volcano, volcanic field. And guess what they're doing at Steamboat Springs? Let's zoom in and show you. They've drilled into it again to get steam to turn these giant sets of turbines. And these are big. And they're all across here, going down to the south. So another spot where we're at a volcanic field where they drilled into it to get steam to turn electrical generating turbines and then spreading out from there we have a series of earthquakes and we may even be right next to a series of high voltage power lines here that are coming from that directly right along the road. Maybe. That's a guess. But either way I always look within 40 miles of a large volcanic field and we're right on the edge of Lake Tahoe. But wait. Lake Tahoe and up here to the north Pyramid Lake the geothermal field right here I just showed you. On the north side of here, we have another geothermal field at the Needles. Fumarole field and geysers at the Needles going into Pyramid Lake. And in between the two, the giant oval shape, which I think personally is a super volcano that has just been missed by professionals. It's lined with volcanoes. We have two deep basins on either side. We have two ge geothermal fields on either side, almost equally spaced. And this thing gets hit with earthquakes around the outside edge of it. That's what's going on here. Over to the east, too. East by northeast. Let's go pull the coordinates here. This should bring us in next to Soda Springs Volcanic Field. Uh, let's see how close we get. These are coordinates from the Europeans, so no biggie. It's just missing a decimal point. That's all. There we go. Yeah, okay. Well, hey, way, way, way. Look where we're at. We're at another geothermal location, which is also solar. Geothermal and solar. These are solar panels. But they're not reflecting that. that these aren't the kind of mirrors that reflect into a hot point. These are geothermal turbines. <laughs> Again, wow. Major, and we're right at the foot of Black Butte Volcano, an ancient undersea volcano back when this used to all be underwater. Wow. Wow. Okay, another electrical generating station. That's too many now. That's just too many. Too many. Something's up. Let's go over to the west. Yountville, California. We're right along the San Andreas. Or no, actually, we're right to the east of the San Andreas. East of Napa Valley. San Andreas is the thick red line. Here's Napa. There's Vacaville or Vacaville. And paste, search, look it up. Inquiring minds want to know. And so do I. So let's go look together, shall we? And there's Napa. Wait a second, is there anything else here? I'm just curious, again, with the, with the amount of high voltage... <laughs> just makes you wonder, is there going to be some kind of giant electrical generating station here? Sorry, I didn't mean to hit the microphone. Well, there's not. We're directly on the fault. What is this? Water? Water filtration. 
Is that that's what it looks like? Looks like a water treatment plant of some kind right there. Okay, well, let's move on. I, I wouldn't think that there's any relation between water treatment plants and earthquakes unless they have some kind of deep drilled well there that's feeding the water in. Then it could. Oh, wait. Hey, look. We're right next to a place that I've never heard of before. Fetter's Hot Spring Agua Caliente. Doesn't Agua Caliente mean hot spring? Or hot water? Let's look it up. Never heard of it before, but if we're right next to a... Fetter's Hot Spring is a census-designated place. Name Agua Caliente translates into English from Spanish as hot water, referring to the hot springs historically found in the area. Well, that kind of changes it a little bit. Hot springs. Well, that's on the south side of Geyser Peak. So, wouldn't you think that maybe there's geothermal up in here then? I, again, it, it's a guess. Maybe that's what that is. Because if these are geothermal fed, and it's just not place marked, like this is being fed geothermally somehow, and that's what, giving it its color or something, that could be. And if it's a geothermal hot spring, that's basically taking us right into the cause of the earthquake. It's a weak point where magma is down below, heating the area. <laughs> okay, this is getting into this is getting to be an interesting update. Let's go across the bay. Rolling Wood, California, at a five-kilometer depth. Let's see where we are again in relation to the faults and plates. Tectonic plates, U.S. faults. Oh, we're right on it. The Hayward? Isn't that the Hayward? Oh, man, let me get my fault names right here. Hayward, yeah, okay. Hayward Fault. And we'll put the coordinates in. There we are. We have the big power station over to the east, but we are on the Hayward directly. I wonder if there's anything else here nearby. What is... What do we have? Well, I mean, if you're on the Hayward Fault, that's pretty much a guarantee that it's related to the Hayward Fault. It's the, one of the most famous faults on the planet, at least in the United States. Like it's in movies, it's in James Bond, A View to a Kill. That's actually a pretty ironic movie, isn't it? Have you guys ever seen James Bond, A View to a Kill? With Richard Moore. Wait, isn't that his name? Ah, eh, whatever. Moore, the uh, Bond. And uh, it's got Christopher Walken playing the bad guy. And his name's Zorin, flying around in a blimp. They engage in a battle on the Golden Gate Bridge here, but... Zorin's evil plan was to take the oil wells and pump them full of salt water, which in the Bond movie, they say in the movie, that's insanity to pump salt water down into the faults or into the drill points because that could induce earthquake activity, which would set off a big earthquake. And the plan in the movie was to flood Silicon Valley so that Zorin could corner the microchip market and tech, tech market. And and Bond, of course, Bond gets with the Bond girl in, in the movie, and she's the USGS scientist. <laughs> ah, anyway, it all takes place here. And they, they plant a giant bomb on the Hayward Fault to trigger an earthquake that then floods, that causes a subsidence here, which then lets the bay to flood in. Anyway, why is that so ironic? What is fracking? Pumping salt water down into the wells with chemicals to break apart the shale <laughs> to release the gas. Ah, nothing go wrong there. Let's go over to the east and go check out this 1.2. Clayton, California. Now, this is so ironic because this, the spot we just looked up was called Richmond Heights. And I lived in Richmond Heights, Missouri, which is so weird. Again, you, you zoom in on the location. It was just called Richmond Heights. I don't know if you saw that when I zoomed in. That's so weird because now we're going to Clayton. I lived in Clayton, Missouri. Diff the same town names across a whole state? That's weird. Where are we here? We're at a quarry. Is this some kind of quarry blast? 12.7 kilometer depth. No, it's not a quarry blast. But it is next to a at least 500 foot deep quarry filled with water. I wonder... Are there anything, is there anything else nearby? 
some kind of radio tower there. But that's, again, we're 12 kilometers down inside of the crust, right next to a quarry. Wouldn't you think that quarrying right alongside of the most famous fault on the planet probably isn't the best idea? Surface perforations can lead to seismic activity. Think of it like this. The fault's already there. You drill down in or break in over the course of a kilometer or a mile and create a weak point at the surface, like scoring the surface of a piece of stone and then applying pressure to it. Let's go down to the south, southeast of Monterey Bay and take a look here. 2.5, 1.6. Pinnacles, California, right off of the San Andreas. Coordinates tell the tale of what's there. And I think we should have some place marks here nearby by Pinnacles. Since this is a regular spot to get hit. On the San Andreas. You can see the diagonal line of the San Andreas. It goes in the mountains themselves all the way down to the east-southeast. And you see there's a break point here. The mountains kind of fan off over to the east, don't they? And over to the east, you see what I have marked. And these are confirmed oil wells, oil and gas. Tanks, pumps, jacks, pipelines that connect across the fields, at least four of them in this field alone. Then we go over to the east and there's a few more. Oil and gas mainly. Mainly oil, I think. But it branches off. It goes right over to the east. And you can see it in the mountains branching off the fault that branches off to go over to the east. But let's go look at the USGS map, see if they have it marked. They don't. It's obvious it goes over to the east when you look at it from Google Earth like a ramp going off the San Andreas. And at the end of the ramp are all the drill points. Then we go down to the south. Let's carry on. The earthquake's down to the south, 1.4, 0 0.9. Small again, San Ardo, California. Tectonic plates, U.S. faults. You'll see we're right on the San Andreas. But look what's over to the east. Do you see it says Colinga? Why are we going down to here? It's just stopping. It doesn't pick up anywhere beyond that, all the way down to the L.A. Basin. So we go down here to the south, we stop at more drill points. And I'll prove that to you. I'll grab the coordinates. Oh, look at the coordinates. Not even going to say it. Not even going to say it. We'll just paste them in and go look. Not impressed. I'm not impressed. Here we go. If you did my birthday, I'd be impressed. You do that number, it's just so run-of-the-mill these days. It's a blasé number. It's been adopted by a bunch of weirdos. Over here to the east, Kolinga. And Kolinga's been drilled over and over again, thousands of times. All of these are oil and gas wells. And the oil patch is huge. It goes up to the north and just keeps going and going and going. All these little black splotches on the ground, like ants on the ground, different oil wells. And there's a solar farm right there. That is a little solar farm right there, but other than that, all drill points all the way down. And we keep going down and further to the south, and the drill points carry on. Just tens of thousands of them at this point by the time we get down to here. So our drill points start pretty much in earnest at Colinga. Kettleman City, Colinga, right up here, thousands of them start. And that's where our earthquakes come down to. And you'll see again, they don't really have it marked. Let's, let's just make sure. I want to go check and make sure the USGS doesn't have this mark. Yeah. See this straight line of the San Andreas? See this? They have a fault marked over here. Let's see if I can get a name on it. Nunes Fault. <laughs> well, that's not really going to help, but you can see it on Google Earth that coming off of the San Andreas, going over to the east again, another set of mountains. So there again, they're like off-ramps on the highway. The other one up here to the north is more visible. It's so obvious. But again, if this is the highway, this is the off-ramp. And the earthquakes are taking the off-ramp over into the valley to the drill points that are perforation points. They're weak points that it heads over to. So we just looked up all the earthquakes all the way down California's coast down to here so far. We already looked up the ones up at the California-Nevada border. So let's go to the California-Nevada border, central California, and go down to the south. Look all these up. I'll just tell you right now. All of these locations here, volcanoes. Every one of them. Right next to one. So here, Super Volcano. Long Valley Caldera. Here, Mono Lake. 
Over here to the east, a series of volcanoes starting just next to Aurora Bodhi Crater, and then ending over here to the far east, over next to Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Buttes. Down to the south, we're at the Big Pine Volcanic Field, just south of the super volcano. Did I say all of them are volcanoes? Well, hold on. There's one over here to the east that I don't quite know what's at the location. Ah, uh, let's go look it up and go see what's over at Tanopa. I, I'm not quite sure what's over here. Don't you want to see? I mean, if all the other locations are volcanoes, and I can prove that to you. But what's here? Well, Thunder Mountain Volcano. But there's also a few other here things, uh, other things here nearby. Lunar craters and goblin knobs over to the east. Black Buttes, Thunder Mountain, there's Monte Cristo over to the west. So, is it related to the volcanoes? Yes. Likely, it's related to this. To the volcano here, Thunder Mountain. Since it's right next to it, wouldn't you think the magma chamber down below is somehow becoming perturbed? which is then leading to seismic activity, but I do have to inspect and see if there's anything else nearby, just in case. I see some old farm fields and a few old roads. This is proof there's not high voltage power lines everywhere, are there, right? Let's go down the road and go see. Yeah, those aren't high voltage. There's no high voltage power lines for miles around. All the way down to the south, that's a road. So, the only thing I would think it's related to is the volcano right next to it. And it's ancient. These volcanoes formed when this was all underwater. You can see the remnants of the ancient ocean still over in Salt Lake City, the Great Salt Lake. But you can see where it used to go to. The Great Salt Ocean used to expand all the way across Nevada, all the way up to the north, up into Idaho and Oregon. It all drained out, by the way, through the Grand Canyon. Shh. You scare him away. Shh. <laughs> it's my Steve Irwin. Oh my God, it's this Steve Irwin in First Nation. No. Shh. Quiet. You scared away. <laughs> all right. Volcano. Now, Monte Cristo Hills, where all of these are, that's a volcanic center. Mono Lake and Long Valley and Big Pine. Let's just prove to you that those are volcanoes in case you don't know about them. Here's Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Center, where the 12-mile-long crack in the ground formed this past year. 6.5 earthquakes struck first, then at the same time, a 12-mile-long crack in the ground formed here, going pretty much west to east. Then, over the past couple months, new outbreaks over here at this quarry location. Right here on the side of this old lava flow, there's an old set of quarries, don't look like they're even getting used much. There's like collapses that happen across the roads. It kind of lets you know there's no real quarrying going on there now. But the surface fissure fracture started over here at Monte. It went all the way over to the west. And now we have the earthquakes breaking out at the man-made pit points. Like I told you over in California or anywhere else where we have these quarries. We have quarries. The earthquakes can seek out those like perforation points or scoring points in the surface of a piece of stone. Mono Lake, Long Valley, Big Pine. Let's carry on. Here's Mono Lake, volcanic field. The earthquake's coming in right at the border, right here at the edge of Mono Lake. Long Valley Caldera, oval shape, supervolcano, 1,000 cubic kilometers of melt down below it. And the earthquakes are coming in on the south edge of the caldera in, well, Right here, just north of it, they drilled in to get steam, to turn the turbines, to provide more power. Another one. Let's go down to the 0 0.4, a lone earthquake, out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada, Indian Springs, 9.4 kilometers down in the crust. This is just the lone one. You just got to look up. There could be a UFO there. <laughs> Psych. Yes, I just psyched you. Radical, man. Now look where we are, though. I do recall this is a location we've looked up before. It sure is. This is Doomtown. The 
Operation Rise Line location, where they did surface nuclear tests and underground nuclear tests. The underground nuclear test, like this one, U.S. Nuke Operation Waco, December 1st, 1987, 20 kilotons. Just so many of them. I mean, we can just keep going. You guys are welcome to come in and check these out. U.S. Nuke Operation Jib. <laughs> what a name. May 8th, 1974, 20 kilotons. Somebody was jibbing it up out there because that's just the dumbest thing in the world to do underground nuke test like that's not going to cause man-made faults what's this one called operation minute steak oh no it'll cook a steak in a minute september 12 1969 they don't list the the kilotons on that but certainly that blast will be cooking your steak five kilotons five kilotons oh my god what a name i'm out of here Let's go down to the south. And this line of quakes, it mimics where there's a series of volcanoes. But we actually start, the cluster starts just north. And then, well, the cluster picks up in earnest right next to the volcanoes. So I'll pull the northernmost part of the cluster at Little Lake. And then we'll just look like five miles to the west-northwest of there. And that's where we start. And paste in search. What is at the location I'm getting ready to show you? Do you see these lava flows? Going back to the peaks, Volcano Peak, and all its lava flows. But we just go right up here, and this is Kozo Volcanic Field. Like I said, we go five miles to the northwest. You know what? Let's just pull the coordinates on that. Instead of just guessing where it is, let's actually put them in. 3.3 kilometer depth. Paste and search. There we are. North side of Kozo Volcanic Field. Earthquake coordinates there. Rising obsidian domes. These are being pushed up by magma from down below. What's the name of this one? Cactus Peak, for instance. These will erupt at some point in the future, most likely. Here's Devil's Kitchen pumping operation. Not for oil or gas. Geothermal. Pipelines, drill points, steam, the whole bit. Electrical generation again. That's where we start. On the north side of the volcanic field that they drilled into to get electric. Then a line of quakes going down on the east side of the vol volcanoes at Volcano Peak and going down and dead ending right down here south of Ridgecrest next to the Lava Mountains. And I just want to see how far down we go to the east-southeast, so let's go look. Cyril's Valley. Of course, that's the triangulated coordinates, but there's probably something else here. The only way to know is to look, though. There's all the mines over to the east by northeast. And over here to the west, by northwest, are all those military test range. ranges. Now, somebody told me that this is where they test rockets. I wouldn't be surprised. It kind of looks like it. You know, where you'd put a rocket in there or something, and they'd... You can see the blast radius on that, all right? That kind of looks like maybe they might be right. Maybe it is a test range for rockets. I don't know. I don't have a place mark for it. But there's enough other weird facilities that are out here that make me think that it is something to do with rockets. It wouldn't surprise me since Boeing and all these other big defense companies do all their testing right here at China Lake going out to the east between Cyril's Valley and China Lake. Let's just turn on our places, see if it has it marked. I mean, it might, we might be able to get a, a place mark on it or something. Let's see. No? Weapons Survivability Laboratory. Yeah, that's all we need to know. Let's move on out of that. And go down to the south. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Over here in the valley, a single 1.0. Bodefish, California. Bodefish. Paste and search. Ah, yes. This is how you find stuff, guys. You got to look it up yourself. It's not like they're going to tell you. You think you're going to go on to the USGS site? It's going to be like, at a missile test site facility. You're like, no. They're not going to ever tell us. We're right next to where all those fires broke out. And we have an old frack well. I have it labeled as hidden frack well. There we go. Okay, so old tanks connected by some kind of pipeline. I don't think that's in use anymore. That's just some kind of old tank apparatus out there. But we're right next to an old oil field that's still being used today. This thing goes back 50 years. 
but all of the drill points across the farmer's fields here. Every one of these is a different oil well, and it just literally goes across the fields out into the desert through the orchards and then up here to what I would call insane overdrive drilling where we can just look off into the extreme distance off to the horizon and it's as far as the eye can see drill points every one of these is a different oil well okay and it goes up all of this down across all of this and we go down to the south tip look where we are Here's the valley. This is the south tip of the valley of California. Here's the San Andreas. And look what goes right up to the San Andreas on this side. Do you see how many different drill points there are? Like, are you kidding me? And I'm not against oil and gas, but they did the whole mountain range this way. This is what the mountain range used to look like. I love showing this because this really tells us what it used to look like. So this is, you know, again rolling gullies and hillsides now we go right over to where they just they started scraping off the hilltops here and once you get over to here the whole mountain range has been scraped every gully top or every hilltop has been scraped and then they put a pad or a couple of oil wells on top and they did the whole mountain range this way and this is the san andreas and it goes right all of these drill points and these spread out each drill point doesn't just go straight up and down vertically these go out horizontally. They can go right underneath the San Andreas, right up to it. Like they could come down and go over like several miles. And this is, again, all of this from up here to down at the south tip of the valley, going around the bend of the south tip of the valley, down around this way, back up this way. Do you see? And we carry on up to the north. The whole valley in a giant letter J shape has been drilled. And the earthquakes come down the San Andreas, stop pretty much right where the drill points start. And then they pick back up down where the drill points stop. In other words, it's like a road that goes across and it's made a perforation point for this to travel across from the San Andreas down to the south tip of the valley instead of going down the San Andreas. It diverts the flow over into the middle of the valley, over to Ridgecrest, over to the desert. I think they did that on purpose. I think somebody 50 years ago figured out what I figured out. And they've kept it a giant secret. And they know that pressure transfers across regions. And that drill points act like perforations or scoring in a piece of stone. And that they did this on purpose over the course of 50 years. Byproduct is oil. That the added benefit to this is we will give you permission to drill this all out. And we're using this as a buffer point to attract earthquakes to go down into the valley and over into the desert, as opposed to go down to the heavy, heavily populated areas down to the south. And only when the flow is overwhelming does it bypass that and go down the San Andreas. So it takes a huge push now to come down the San Andreas to cause activity in Southern California. Instead, it goes over into the valley like they want it to, and directed it to with all the drill points. And that they know what I know, and they've known it for 50 years, and kept it a secret on purpose. Let's go down into the LA Basin and go quickly look up this earthquake up in Northwest LA, or Chatsworth, California. Is this even really part of LA? It's on the Northwest side. Put the coordinates in. Search. Where are we going? Well, I say, old boy, we're going on the south side of the Aliso Canyon gas storage pumping operation. And this thing blew up. There were a series of earthquakes that came down this mountain range. Here to the north, you see where it says oil wells and Fillmore? This is several years ago. Earthquakes came down and were coming down right towards here. I started to make videos about the earthquakes coming in. The professionals came out and said there was no relation between the pumping operations and the earthquakes. This is several years ago. Within weeks of that, this blew. And a lot of stored gas came out and they had to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people. And people had instant nosebleeds as soon as the gas hit their nose. Instant nosebleeds. Across this whole area. As the gas escaped. And they denied the relation leading up to the explosion. The seismic that was coming across right to it. Now we're to the east of Simi Valley. 
and I've got viewers over here in Simi Valley. But I don't think there's any drill points here, at least none that I know of, right across here in the valley. So we are actually just south of the drill points, and I need to measure to see how far we are. I always look 6 to 10 miles. It might be more than that. Hold on. No, never mind. It's 4 miles. Definitely close enough to the storage points and to the drill points. Had to look it up. We have to look them up. Now, I got to address this. No big earthquake down in Southern California. Instead, it went over to the east. Went over to Colorado. Dang. Well, you can't win them all the time, guys. But it went over to Colorado as expected and down into Texas. But it did not strike down south, just north of LA on the San Andreas. Let me show you where I warned and where I flopped. Now, this is proof I don't get it right all the time, guys. I'll tell you what we warned for again in a second, but right here, okay, nothing. Here's LA, you know, going down in the basin and stuff. <laughs> and stuff. Oh no. Did I really just get that casual with you folks? Well, welcome into the Dutch Sense house. We're here to have a good afternoon. Uh, go down in Southern California and stuff. Okay, so we're back down here in the LA Basin, and there's no activity of any significance up to the north. I warned for a 5.5. Nothing hit. But Colorado got hit with a mid-range 4. So energy is going across the plate. It might very well be that I'm just wrong on the time scale, and it's going to take a week and a half as opposed to a week. But I warned for a week. It came and went. Now the warning's expired. Where did the energy go? So far, it all went over to Colorado for sure. That's marked by the new four over in Colorado. As expected, by the way, we warned for fours, and fours came rolling in. But Southern California still cut off. And I think we know where the cutoff point is. It's right up here at Monte Cristo, going across California diagonally down to the coast. Where again, basically right down to here. Everything back behind it is getting suspicious. There should be a break. The lack of reporting of earthquakes across Washington and Oregon. It, I mean, there could be a lack of earthquakes and an actual lack of earthquakes. It could be. But that would mean something noteworthy is coming then. I would think that there's a system outage of some kind or a deliberate lack of reporting of earthquakes. That would be the more logical to think. Do plates stop shifting? Hey, you know, let's use China and Russia, for example, again. Do whole plates stop shifting for weeks? Or do we not report earthquakes in those locations? Okay, let's wrap it up with Hawaii. Hawaiian viewers, aloha. Aloha. Let's go see what's going on. Three clusters of quakes, really. You could maybe even say four if you want to include the two down to the south as a cluster, but I would just say three clusters. One, Mauna Kea. Two, Kilauea. Three, in between, Mauna Loa, Kilauea, and Loihi. Okay, so let's go look them up and see what's there. Out to Hawaii we go. Three clusters of quakes around, what do you know? Kilauea. Kilauea here. Line of quakes going on down here right along the coast. And a line of quakes going on up here on the north side of Mauna Kea. All three, I believe truly now, are definitely related to the Middle East with zone rising. Now, they're not telling us about a rise, though. Maybe there is no actual surface rise going on. Then it's more just taking that energy and spreading it out across the whole island to the other weak points. Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa and down next to Loihi, the undersea mount out in the ocean. Now, there's people that are covering this in Hawaii that I think are doing a phenomenal job, and you guys should check those out. I, I'm not gonna, I don't have, actually even have the names on me, but there's people in Hawaii that are covering this on a semi-daily basis, cover, or at least a weekly basis, covering this. Not the USGS, I'm talking about average citizens that are driving around the area out there. Uh, I think Hawaii Volcano News, or Hawaii News on YouTube. But this is the Middle East Rift Zone. The earthquakes are going around it and at the top of it. So it's most likely due to magma recharging inside. It does not mean an imminent eruption of any kind. I think it would take a lot of energy to cause it to blow. And that energy would come from maybe... Oh, a new earthquake just struck there as I'm talking. 
Okay, let's get on out of here. Cue up the Twilight Zone music. A new 1.9 just hit in Hawaii, as I'm talking about. When did it hit? Hold on. 2032 UTC. Four minutes ago. Or wait, six minutes ago. All right. Well, anyway, the volcanoes are recharging there. I think it'll take a big push to get it to blow, like it did last time. you got to remember what happened the last time Kilauea blew, when this whole thing collapsed and it blew up. There was a huge deep earthquake event taking place around the Pacific Plate. Something like a hundred different deep earthquakes had happened around the Pacific Plate in less than a month's time. Like a phenomenal amount of deep earthquakes taking place. Then, same day that Hawaii collapsed, Cleveland volcano up here in Alaska blew. Same day. Same day it drained out and collapsed. So I would say it would take something similar to that type of event for us to see another eruption. But famous last words, I don't forecast eruptions, but if I see a bunch of deep earthquakes or a lot of activity spreading across, I will certainly let you know in Hawaii. So otherwise, you pay attention to the USGS and them issuing one of these warnings that's like, you have a day or less, there's harmonic tremors and sulfur dioxide coming out. That's when you know there'll be a blast, according to the USGS. Tilt meters will be going off. Sulfur dioxide levels will be going up. Nitrous oxide levels will be coming out of the ground or something. And that's when you'll know something's getting ready to happen. I don't know if nitrous oxide, but certainly sulfur dioxide would be coming out of the ground. Do you have an earthquake plan? You know, after covering all this, I think what I've really just covered is just a handful of the overall global activity that we should be getting if we could get the information out of China and Russia, India, and... I mean, if we could get that all, you would see even more activity in 24 hours. But this gives us a good picture. Europe's moving around the outside edge. Both sides, East and West Europe, with the biggest amount of movement in the middle in the 4.0 range. We have new fours coming into Europe now that are going to add up to about a five striking down in Greece again. But that gets into a new forecast. I will get a new forecast out likely tomorrow. So I'll have a new forecast out tomorrow. This is just the update. This update took a long time because there's a lot of activity to talk about. Size-wise, the size of the earthquakes, knock on wood right now, is in the 5 and 6.0 range. That's good. We would like to see it in that lower range as opposed to a higher range. Now, it could go higher still. We have new deep earthquakes that are taking place. But this past week, we were looking for it to go up to 7, and the highest it went was 6. Still, though, that's still shallower, larger earthquakes. We had deep 4s and deep 5s. Now we have shallow 5s and shallow 6s, a magnitude higher than what the deep earthquakes are. But what happened with that solar storm on the 10th, 10 days ago? 10 days ago, there was that solar storm that arrived. There was an increase. There was a dramatic increase in the number of earthquakes. We talked about it. The snare drum picked up. And a few sixes popped off after a few days without any. But that's not that big. I'll just say it. That's not that big. But the snare drum roll was no noticeable, especially on the West Coast. You guys saw it. Huge stacks of zeros, ones, twos, and threes. With a, an ultimate five striking on the West Coast of the United States over at the California-Nevada border. 4.9. That's what happened this past week with the solar storm. But then again, the solar storm was not the biggest ever. It was the biggest in the last year and a half, which is not really saying much because the sun's been in low mode, if you will. The solar minimum. Few solar events. Few flares. Few CMEs. Not even that many coronal holes, really, with strong solar wind even. It's been really low solar for the last year and a half or two years. So that CME, that coronal mass ejection that just happened, was just a moderate-sized CME. But it was the biggest in a year and a half. So it can be the biggest in a year and a half and still be not that big. And that's what it looks like it is. Now, those are famous last words, too. What if it's just taking 10 days instead of 7 to have an effect, right? But I base my observations on what I've seen in the past or I base my projections on the observations of what I've seen in the past. And in this case, it seems to be pretty low. How about all those drill points? All those power locations? 
Do you live next to a power generating station? <laughs> you might want to have an earthquake plan, apparently. Same with the nuke plants. Apparently those power generating stations also have earthquakes that strike next to the nuclear power plants. You know, it's just something we have to pay attention to. It's something that we didn't know was going on for many years. And this year is the first year that we really figured out that earthquakes are striking next to all these power lines and power locations. I had my sneaking suspicions with the nuke plants because they started getting hit with earthquakes, but I never bothered to look beyond that. Now that we're seeing a relation, man, that's wild. Some kind of electric coming up out of the crust or electric going down into the crust. Either it's pulling it, either the power lines are pulling the energy up out of the crust, calling it, causing an earthquake, or the power lines are dumping energy down into the crust and causing an earthquake. Or somehow Mother Nature is bombarding the power lines, which then is going down into the crust and causing earthquakes. So it could be solar. It could be man-made. It could be a combination of the two. It could be natural coming up from the core of the earth, electric coming up out of the ground. Nonetheless, earthquakes. That would mean there's an electrical earthquake connection, which we already know there is. Earthquake lights. Air glow that happens, like the northern lights, but from earthquakes from tensions in the crust. They call them earthquake lights. USGS has pictures of them on their website even. Okay. What was I saying? Do you have an earthquake plan? Man, I got distracted there. Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes? You should at least take shelter underneath a table or a desk. That's a no-brainer idea. Table or desk, take shelter. Try to ride it out. If you're not confident in your structure, you also need to have a place to go outside or a pre-designated area, kind of like a fire drill where you know there's not anything around that's going to cause you major harm or damage if you need to exit the building. Because you surely don't want to be running out into a city street with falling glass and things off tall buildings if you could have just taken shelter inside of your building. Yes, there might be falling drywall and ceiling panels and light fixtures, but that's better than falling glass from 50 stories up and facades off the fronts of buildings. So know your location, please. And make sure your friends, family, loved ones, your, even your co-workers, that you know where to go outside to meet up if you have to. Now, if you're going outside to meet up or if you're going to go outside at all, you need to have a seasonal specific emergency kit that you put together yourself. Shouldn't cost you much money at all. A bag that you can grab that has a change of clothes, set of shoes, seasonal specific, first aid, sanitation, batteries for a flashlight. You don't want to be caught using your phone for a flashlight the whole time. Think of the things that you might need if you require medicines. Again, that first aid and sanitation is a must. Extra set of keys, extra ID, extra debit card, or maybe even extra cash if you have it. But some kit that you put together yourself that you know where to grab it at a moment's notice. And it will come in handy for things other than earthquakes, severe weather, an evacuation for a fire or a flood, power outage. Even if you lose your car keys, you could have an extra set or house keys. Extra set in the emergency kit, just in case. I'm just getting a little annoying by reminding you in such a way. I have to be a little harpy on this to get people to do it. A lot of people just say, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, and they never do. So I, I would appreciate it if you did it. Whether you love me or hate me or whatever. What good is any of that <laughs> if you don't survive an earthquake that you could have known was coming or could have been prepared for? All right. I will be back if anything else goes down. Much love to everybody. And I am saving this. And we are going to put this over on YouTube for people to watch back. Finally. It's been about a week. <laughs> Much love, guys. Peace out.